Good morning, Pitnass Church. Welcome home. Would you stand with us as we enter into worship this morning? We worship the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, my God, he holds the victory, yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet, we'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet, we'll shout out your praise. Whoa, we'll shout out your praise. We sing, we sing to the God who we sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. See, he hung up on that cross, and he rose up from that grave. My God's still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. Oh, we'll shout out your praise. Because we were the beggars. Now we're Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Come on, we were the beggars. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners. Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy. Come on. We're going to shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. We won't be quiet. We'll shout out your praise. Whoa. Hey, turn to your neighbor, say good morning.
the same God that never fails. He will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Oh, yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. Oh, yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will for all my Yes, I choose, I choose to praise, to glorify, to glorify the name of all days. But nothing can stand against, I choose to praise, to glorify, to glorify the name of all days. But nothing can stand against, I choose to praise. Glorify, to glorify the name of all names That nothing can stand against I choose to praise Glorify, to glorify the name of all names That nothing can stand against Oh yes, I will lift you high In the lowest valley, yes, I will Bless your name, oh yes, I will sing for joy when my heart is heavy all my days, oh yes, I will for all my days, oh yes, I will for all my days, yes, I will. as we continue to worship, we want to invite you at this time as we sing another song. If you have something that's weighing on your heart this morning and you'd like to come pray about that at the altar, then uh, feel free to come do that. If you'd like for one of us pastors to pray with you, if you'd like to be anointed, if you'd like to pray over our prodigal boards over here, uh, those are people who we're praying for salvation or spiritual breakthrough in their lives. So as we continue to worship, we just want to invite you to, uh, to come do one of those things if you'd like. I 
trust in you today. We trust in your unfailing power and your unfailing strength and your majesty. God, you are big enough and strong enough to handle anything that this life throws at us, that the enemy throws at us, and we trust in that. But God, today we also trust in your love. Father, if there's anybody in this room or anybody watching online who has doubts about your love for them, I pray that those doubts would be erased right now in this moment. Father, we trust in your grace and we thank you for your grace. Father, we also thank you for your word. I pray for Kyle as he, as he preaches your word today. Lord, fill him with your spirit. Fill us with your spirit. Give us hearts that say yes to you, yes to your truth, and yes to wherever you want to lead us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. God is good, amen. He's so good. He's so good. Welcome home. We're glad you're here today. Welcome home to those 
that are online today. Um, if you're new and we haven't met, my name's Kyle. I'm one of the pastors here. And we are wrapping up our series today um, on generations. But before we get into that today, I want to share with you a couple things that are going to be coming up. Next week is Vision Sunday. And on this day, next week, we're going to be talking about where we've been, where we are, where we're going. We're going to give you an update on our building. Right before COVID hit, we went into a uh, we launched our building campaign and then COVID hit. Several of you asked where that's at, so we're going to give you an update on that. Some ministry updates, some things to look forward to. It's going to be a great day. Hope you'll be there next week. And then the following week, we're going to start a new series. It's going to be, uh, we've had several of you over the last couple of years ask about mental health. And so we're going to have a series called Light in the Tunnel. Say that with me. Light in the Tunnel in the tunnel. So many times we hear, well, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but we believe a God that provides light in the tunnel, not just at the end of it. And so uh, we're going to look at it from a biblical perspective, look at different stories in scripture where people were dealing with anxiety, depression, suicidal thoughts, all kinds of different things. We're going to cover that. And that'll be a powerful series that'll be coming up. uh, I think that'll last six or seven weeks. So some good stuff coming up. And we're wrapping up today a series called Generations. And we've been looking at one family through multiple generations. We've been seeing the good, the bad, the ugly, and and more importantly, how God has weaved his story and his love into uh, the Israelites. And so today we're wrapping this up looking at the story of Joseph. If you've grown up around the church at all, you're probably pretty familiar with this story. In fact, if some of your kids who've been in children's church much, they probably heard the story of Joseph. And if you haven't, it's a powerful story of God's redemption and just a story of forgiveness and and just being faithful to God. And so we're going to be looking at that um, this morning. It's kind of got a neat uh, twist to it, and so we're looking forward to that. Anyway, as we get into this today, I just want to tell you it covers... uh, chapter 37 of Genesis through chapter 50. So it's 13 chapters, and obviously we can't cover 13 chapters exhaustively in one morning. So we're going to do a little bit of an overview and then just look at different things and stop and, and look at it. But Joseph, as he, he was the 11th son um, of uh, Jacob and Rachel, and he was uh, the first son that Rachel had. And so Joseph was his father's favorite son. And Joseph's brothers hated him for it. So that's a good way to start. That's basically, he was his daddy's favorite. His brothers couldn't stand him for it. And then it didn't help anything when Joseph explains a couple of dreams. Joseph has two different dreams where God explains, it kind of reveals to him that his brothers are going to be bowing down to him. And he begins to share that in almost a way that's a little bit rubbing it in, right? The na 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 boo boo kind of a thing. And that doesn't sit well with Um, with his brothers. And so they get to the place where not only do they hate them, they begin to think of actions in ways to end Joseph. So one day, Jacob, who was later named Israel, sent Joseph to go check on his brothers. And they can see him coming from some distance, right? Um, Some of us can see, you know, who live in the country, maybe you see your parent coming down the road, your spouse coming down the road. They can see him approaching as he's coming. And so they start plotting while he's walking or he's riding a camel or whatever he's doing. And they start saying, hey, let's, let's kill him. Well, Reuben, he says to them, he's the only one that has a little bit of sense. And he's like, look, let's not take his life. Let's throw him into a cistern here in the desert. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe this rich ornamented robe he was wearing, and they took him, let's read it, and they threw him into the cistern. Now, I want to stop there for just a minute because most of us could probably point back to some turning points in our life. In fact, if someone were to say, why are you working, you know, tell me how you became this or why you, the job that you have, there was probably a turning point. Or maybe you've had some crisis situations happen in your life that changed your perspective about something. But we all, in some way, shape, or form, have these turning points in our life where we begin to look at things differently. And it's kind of implied here, and as you read his story, you'll begin to realize that this is really a turning point for, J- for Joseph. Um, at this point, he seems to be a little selfish, and dad's not helping that by being his favorite. And all of a sudden, he gets thrown into this cistern, and he goes on to be this faithful man of God that does all these amazing things for God. And he's faithful to God despite all the, the different things that are going on. But it's this cistern experience, this being abandoned, this cistern experience where God begins to work at him. And so that's worth noting. So they, so they 
don't kill him, but they come up with a story that a wild animal killed him. In fact, they even dip his coat in goat's blood to make their story sound convincing. And Jacob buys the story, his dad, and he's naturally devastated. Meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph, meanwhile, the Midianites sold Joseph in Egypt to Potiphar. And that's where we stop for just a second and make an observation. Joseph's brothers are eaten up with jealousy. Say that with me. Joseph's brothers are eaten up with jealousy. And it's this jealousy that propels them to do some bad stuff. In fact, Genesis 37 says his brothers were what? They were jealous of him, and his father kept this matter in mind. Uh, the word jealous means quana in the, in the Hebrew, which is where the word that we're looking at. It means to be jealous, to be envious, move to jealousy, provoke to jealousy. Um, it even is talking about zeal. So here's what we need to know as we get into this today, not only for Joseph, but for us as well. Jealousy left unchecked leads to all sorts of problems. Amen? It does. It's really what we're talking about here is a posture of the heart. At its root, jealous, being jealous is idolatry. It starts to place our satisfaction in what we want ahead of God's. It's saying that God is, isn't sufficient for us, this thing we want or what they have or, or you know, their position, whatever it might be, is more important to us. And because of that, the only right response, if we're sensing that, is to repent, to turn from that situation. Another place it says, jealousy destroys relationships, it sows discord, and it creates a spirit of bitterness and evil. Now, let me just stop there and cut the tension for a minute, okay? If you have air in your lungs and you're sitting in this room or you're watching online, we have all had moments of feeling jealous in some way, shape, or form. And when that happens, it's our job as, as believers to, as the Spirit prompts us and the Spirit identifies that, that to us, for us to deal with that. That's why it's important to realize left unchecked. In fact, read those yellow words, left unchecked. There are going to be moments where we have a thought, right, where we experience feelings of, man, I wish I had what they had, or man, I wish that I had their position, or in Joseph, Joseph's brother's case, man, I wish I was dad's favorite, man, da 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 and so here's what, here's what we know from Proverbs. It says, a peaceful heart leads to a what? Healthy body. Let's read it together. Jealousy. And that's kind of straightforward, isn't it? Jealousy is like cancer in the bones. And the other thing that's important, you know, you hear kids say, why? You know, why do I need to do this? Maybe even a teenager will say, why do you want me to clean the room? Why is it important that I do this? Why do I need to write thank you cards after my birthday party? You know, why do we do these things? People have questions. So if someone were to say today, why does jealousy matter? And the reality is, is that jealousy doesn't reflect the character and nature of God. Now, some who maybe know scripture would say, well, the Bible calls God a jealous God, right? And that's talking more about when we have an idol in our life, when we put something ahead of God and as it relates to God. But it also is for us in realizing that if we have an idol in our life, that we've put something ahead of God, that's a sin against God. It doesn't reflect the character and the nature of God. I read this quote online. I like this when it's talking about jealousy. Don't just wound it, bruise it, suppress it, or maim it, kill it. Let's read it. For jealousy is one of the sins Christ paid for on the cross, which means it deserves death. If you are a follower of Jesus, if you're checking things out today, and I were to ask you if you're a Christian, you'd say, I, I don't know. But, it, but it, today, if I were to ask you, are you a follower of Christ? And you were to say, yes, I am. Then jealousy really doesn't have a purpose in your life. It doesn't reflect who God is. And in order to, to move past jealousy, we have to get to this place where we say, God, you are more important than this feeling, and I ask you to help me with this. Um, I share this. This is kind of a, a silly thing, but, you know, pastors sometimes, just to be, I'll just go first. I'll be honest with you. Pastors sometimes can, can get jealous, and sometimes as a pastor, you see some churches in other places that, man, look at that. Look at this. Look at that. And, and it can get to the point where you get like, 
almost coveting. And so there's been some people on Facebook that I, you know, you can unfriend and unfollow. And I think it's unfollow where you're still their friend, but they don't show up in your feed. Does that make sense? And I don't do that because I wish anything bad on them, but it's just like, I don't, I don't, if I see that, that creates something in me I don't want, and so it's just better for me to unfollow. I share that with you because if you were sitting in my office and you were struggling with sometimes, sometimes there's some situations where maybe you need to unfollow something, or you need to find a way to get to a place where it's not consuming who you are. I share that with you today. So eventually, Joseph is bought by Potiphar, one of Pharaoh's officials. And God prospers him, and he becomes entrusted with everything in Potiphar's household. So now he's in Potiphar's household. God's, he's been faithful to God. God's been faithful to him, and he's beginning to be in charge. And, and here's what Scripture says. Now, Joseph was what? Which would mean from last week he had that sparkle in his eyes, right? <laughs> he was well-built and handsome. He was easy to look at. You know what I'm saying? It was not hard to look at Joseph. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, really subtly, let's read it, come to bed with me. Okay, I guess that's not subtle. That's straightforward. But scripture says that he what? He refused, right? He was a person of character. He was a person that wanted to do the right thing. And and through this whole trial and suffering and being abandoned by his brothers and thrown into a cistern and sold into slavery, God began to stir something in him, and he was, he was faithful to God. And he's like, no. He says, with me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in this house. Everything he owns, he is entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me. Let's read it. Except, except you, because you are his wife. And then he asks a question, almost this question to rationalize with her, to basically say to her like, hello. He says, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And you're like, drop the mic, right? That's going to get her to quit. I mean, he was, you know, sometimes you need to stand up for yourself. You just need to go into your such and such, and tell them, right? You're not assertive enough. You're too subtle. Well, in this case, he tries to avoid her, but eventually he just gets assertive with her. He's like, look, you're married. I'm not your husband. I want to do what God wants me to do, and I want to honor, and I respect your husband. He's given not only me a job, but he's given me a position here, and leave me alone. There, that'll leave it alone. She'll stop. But scripture says she didn't. In fact, it says, and though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even, let's read that last little phrase, or even, so he's doing, right? He's like, I I just need to remove myself from this situation. I can't do this. Well, one day, things escalate. He goes into the house to attend his duties, and we got a problem. Because obviously in the past, there's other people around that can kind of help, right? But scripture says one, of, one day he went into a house to attend his duties. Let's read the rest of that. And none of the household servants were inside. Not good. She caught him by his cloak. There's no one around and says, come to bed with me. And scripture says, let's read it. He left his cloak in her hand. Man, Joseph ran away from temptation. Church, we can learn something from that today. Amen? He didn't stay there and try to rationalize with her. And the chances are, right, he might have been attracted to her. It says that Joseph was well-built and handsome, and this guy was a leader, and he probably had an attractive wife, and there might have been some attraction there. And Joseph's like, ah. And he, he's he's trying to be faithful and trying to handle it the right way. Listen, no, no, no. Now all of a sudden, no one's around and she escalates and now it becomes physical. She grabs him and he's like, "Mm, I'm out. And he runs away. Folks, can I tell you when it comes to temptation, I think it's important for us to understand it's not temptation if it's not tempting. 
right? In fact, say that with me. It's not temptation if it's not tempting. If my wife leaves a donut in the kitchen on the counter, especially one of those white powdered ones or even those chocolate ones, I'm tempted. I'm not going to lie. And how many of you have ate it before? (laughs) In fact, the other day, my wife made these protein balls. They're supposed to be healthy. Well, they are, unless you eat 12. (laughs) I don't know how many I ate. She goes, hey, uh, where's all the protein balls at? The kids probably ate them. (laughs) She goes, yeah, right. I said, "Ah, I got into them, right? So temptation is something we're tempted with. Joseph is somewhat, you know, if, if he was literally not attracted to her and it was like a grandma to him, he'd be like, listen, granny, look, not going to happen, okay? <laughs> She's got a great personality, okay? I'm not... <laughs> but obviously there's something there. He leaves. And folks, running from temptation is a very wise choice. And I share that with you not just to tell a story that you guys are like, oh, that's a neat story. I share that story with you today because in a group this size online and here in person today, there's at least someone in here. The odds are too high that you are dealing with a tempting thing. It could be to cheat on your taxes or to cheat on a spouse or to not tell the truth. Or I mean, I don't even, I could list all kinds of things. I can't begin to list all the different things that could be, lived, could be in this room. And God wants you to know today, if it's tempting you, Run. And also remember in an encouraging way that walking closely with God helps us stay alert to, to potential temptations. Amen? Now, just because we walk closely with God doesn't mean we're not going to be tempted, obviously. And just because we walk closely to God doesn't mean we're not going to go through trials. In fact, Scripture tells us we still will. But if we're walking with God, we're reading His Word, we're having conversation with God, which is prayer every day. We're not forsaking the assembling together like we are. Those things all help, uh, help alert us, right? If we're walking with Jesus, there's times, this happens to me. I'll just be real with you. A while back, I was frustrated. And I spoke too harshly to someone in my family, and I'm like, what I said, I was good with. I was fine with what I said, okay? But how I said it wasn't great. None of you have ever been there before, but I'm just telling you. And I got away from that conversation, and man, it wasn't very long at all. And God's like, yeah, you're going to need to go fix that. I don't really want to, because then I have to admit that I did something wrong, which I know I did, but God's like, yeah, you need to go right now. It's like, okay. Hey, listen, what I said, I'm good with, but how I said it, I I was wrong, and I'm sorry. Folks, when we walk closely with God... He tells us when we're out of bounds and we're close to going out of bounds. We've got a shock collar on our dog now, however you feel about that, but she keeps digging under the fence, right? And as she gets close to the boundary, it'll start beeping. That's a warning to her that you need to get back because you keep destroying all of her neighbor's fences digging underneath them. And folks, when we're walking with Jesus and we get close to the wrong thing or we're tempted, you know, he'll start to beep us if we're listening, amen? He'll begin to warn us. Listen to this from Paul. No temptation, this is talking about sin. It's, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is what? He's faithful. Let's read those yellow words. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, listen to this, there's a promise. When you are tempted, he will also provide what? A way what? That's a promise. Now, here's the deal. God's responsibility is to provide the way out. Our responsibility is to take it. Well, you know, God, I'm on the side of this mountain here. Am I supposed to take this helicopter to get off or wait for the next one, right? But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out. Let's finish it together so that you can stand up under it. God's word tells us that he will provide a way out for us. So a little bit more of the story. Joseph's integrity is still intact. He runs out of the palace. He he does not give in. But in the meantime, she still has his cloak in her hand. You remember the story? She grabs him by the cloak, and as he 
goes to take a, go away, she still has his cloak and he runs out of there. Good job, Joseph. Whew. His integrity is still intact. However, she accused him of trying to take advantage of her and had him thrown into prison. Now, he didn't. But man, people sometimes can make stuff up. Y'all know that. You know what's scary is if people are willing to bend the truth, everything's fair game, isn't it? If we're willing to lie, we can come up with whatever we want to come up with. And she makes this accusation, accusation to him, and he's put in jail. So now he's in jail. Right? He's in the tunnel. Remember the series, Light in the Tunnel? He's in the tunnel. He's, he, the light's not, he's not out of the tunnel. He's in the tunnel. But God is with him. Amen? While Joseph was there in prison, let's read this next little phrase. The Lord, the Lord was with him. Some of you are in the tunnel. Some of you are in the prison right now. Some of you are being falsely accused. Some of you are being misunderstood. And you're trying to do the right thing, can I tell you? God is faithful. He is with you, and, the, and he's with Joseph here. And Scripture says that he showed him kindness. God showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no... Listen to this. Talk about trust level here. The warden paid what kind of attention? No attention to anything under Joseph's care. Let's read it. Because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success. Folks, God is faithful to Joseph, and Joseph is faithful to God. We can gain from that today that we're called to stay faithful to God even when things aren't going our way. That's a very basic fact that children should learn in children's church, that we should learn from a very young age. Just because you don't get, it's not your time to to have the toy doesn't mean you get mad, right? Just because things aren't going your way doesn't mean you turn your back on God. And in this room and online today, there's some of us right now that if I were to ask you just right now, you don't have to tell me your story. If I just said this to you without telling me your whole life story, are things going your way right now? And a few of you would say, yeah, yeah, they are. Adam, it's going Adam's way right now. Texas beat Alabama yesterday, okay? (laughs) He's got the hook'em horns up, and if he took his shirt off right now, he's got a burnt orange shirt underneath right now. He's super excited. He's got this pasted smile on his face. Adam, no one cares if Texas won, okay? <laughs> Austin's like, no, 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 <laughs> right? Like, sometimes things go our way, and some of you would be in here and say, yep, it was a beautiful day this weekend, played some golf, or got to hang out, or I went shopping, or was just relaxed, right? But a lot of you, if I were to say things aren't going your way right now, you'd say, amen, they're not. And if you were to say that today, can I tell you, in the midst of things not going your way, stay faithful to God. Don't turn your back on God because things aren't great. God doesn't promise us when we follow him that things are going to go the way we want them to all the time. But we can remember this, the encouragement part. When we are walking with God, his presence is present, no matter the circumstances. Folks, that was worth coming to church for for someone today. When you are walking with God, let's read it. His presence is present no matter the circumstances. Listen to David. Remember, sometimes we'll read this at funerals. You go to a funeral, this will be the scripture on the little pamphlet you get before you go in and to share your, your grief with the family. We've read it before. It's still true. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of life? No, what's it say? Death, right? David is saying, even though I walk through the valley, what imagery? I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil for you are, talk about someone who understands what it's like to be faithful to God, even though things aren't going his way. I will fear no evil for you are with me. Let's read it. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. David is reminding us here today, church, that even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we have nothing to fear because God is with us. And in the midst of whatever you're going through today, 
take comfort in the fact that you are not in that valley alone. We talked about the footprints in the sand. You are not on the beach alone. God is with you. Well, eventually, Joseph, he gets out of prison because he was able to interpret Pharaoh's dream. In fact, Joseph ended up second in command of Pharaoh, and he helps him prepare for a seven-year famine by stockpiling during a seven-year surplus. And later, the famine is in full swing. Again, we're really paraphrasing this because it's a long story. The famine is in full swing, and Joseph's family comes calling. Remember, Joseph's now only second in command to, uh, to Pharaoh, and he's pretty much in charge of everything. And this famine is in full swing after the seven years of plenty. And Joseph's, Joseph's family comes calling. And he kind of puts them through some tests. But eventually he reveals who he is. And Joseph ends up forgiving his family for what they had done. And he reunited with his dad. Joseph had his chariot, scripture says. Joseph had his chariot made ready. And he went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. Because as, as he comes up with you know, telling them, hey, you can come, you can be with me, I forgive you for what you've done. Eventually, Joseph's dad makes his way back. And remember, at one point, Joseph's dad believed that Joseph is dead. And so this is kind of a a reuniting story here. It says, Joseph has his chariot made ready, and he goes to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father, let's read it, and they wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph, now I'm ready to die since I've seen for myself that you are still alive. You know, if anybody would have, have the right to hold a grudge for what had happened, it would be Joseph, right? Now, Joseph's brothers could be petty, much like sometimes people can be. And he could say to them, look, I realize we threw you in a cistern and a few of us wanted to kill you, but one of the brothers said, let's just sell you. You do realize that even though we almost had you killed and then we sold you and we threw you in a cistern on a hot day, I realize all that stuff is bad, but you got to admit you were kind of a spoiled brat, right? I mean, like those things don't balance out. Like you're a spoiled brat, so we tried to kill you, but then we tried to sell you. I mean, so we're even, right? Of course not. Yeah, Joseph was probably being a little bit annoying and bragging about the fact that he was his dad's favorite, and then God gives him these dreams, and so he puts it in their face. Hey, God said, you're going to be bound down to me. Okay? It wasn't just daddy that said that. It was God. (laughs) Hey. Okay, maybe you take him out and slap him. You don't sell him. (laughs) So if anybody had a reason to hate and to hold on to, it would have been Joseph. But Joseph doesn't hold on to it. He forgives his brothers. And not only forgives them, but forgives their poor choices against him. Folks, forgiveness is a powerful demonstration of God's nature at work in us. Listen to this. These are Jesus' words. If you have a Bible where you have red letters like in the New Testament, in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those red words, those are Jesus' words. This is what Jesus says. For if you forgive men when they sin against who? You. It doesn't say when they sin against themselves. When they sin against you. For if you forgive a man when they sin against you, your heavenly Father, let's read it, will also forgive you. Whew, that's good. But Jesus doesn't start there. Stop there. He says, but, let's read it. If you do not forgive men their sins, your Father... We've said this before in Scripture. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. We forgive because Christ has forgiven us. As I've shared many times, this is a a message, a theme, a thought that we have to repeat over and over because it's so easy to forget when we get emotions involved. You hurt me. You made me feel. You left me. You tried to kill me. You abandoned me. And it gets personal because sometimes those people are family members, right? 
People that should protect you and have your back. That's why the deepest hurt is by, usually by the ones that we love the most or that have the most responsibility in our lives. Mom didn't do what they were supposed to. Dad didn't do what they were supposed to. Maybe both. Maybe a family member took advantage of you and you've never, ever let that go. And can I tell you, if you were to hear to say, I, I don't know how to do that, I would say, you can't. It's only something, especially those deep, 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 deep hurts. It's only something that God, through his grace, being connected to him, allows us to do. And that's good news because it's not our strength. It's his. And you know what's crazy? You want to see like a healthy like end result here? Not only does Joseph forgive his brothers for what they've done to him, but his perspective about the situation is different. You see, our perspective about trials is really important. Listen to this. Joseph's talking to his brothers and like, oh, sorry about trying to kill you, man. <laughs> sorry about trying to sell you. I'm just thankful Reuben, Reuben didn't go along with the rest of us. He'd have been dead right now, but sorry about that. And then Joseph says, listen, don't be distressed and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me here. Let's read it. Because it was to save lives. <sighs> Perspective, right? I did a sermon one time, and I've, I heard this thought from someone else on having a resurrected perspective, right? We believe in the resurrection that Jesus rose to life. He didn't just raise to life to save us from hell, in part, yes, but also to give us a renewed mindset, a resurrected mindset. Talk about a resurrected perspective. Listen, you tried to sell me. You tried to kill me. And I could have been really angry about that. And to be honest with you, I went through that. But looking back on that and, and, and God spending time with him and, and communion with him, I realized that it was God who was trying to save lives. There was going to be this famine. It was going to be really bad. And God used the situation to bring about your rescue. So don't be distressed. For two years now, there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years, there will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth. Let's read it. And to save. We talked last week, right? Some of you that were here, the, the old farmer that gets up and prays, he says, God, I, I hate flour. It tastes bad. God, I hate eggs. It tastes bad. And he just lists all the ingredients that go into bread. And he says, Lord, they taste terrible, but Father, I love it when it's finished. I love bread when it's finished. But sometimes we want to get in the bowl while God's still mixing and we get mad because it tastes bad. The Bible tells, it, tells us to trust in the Lord with all our heart. There's another part there that's really important. And lean not, if you know it, say it with me, on your own in all your ways. Acknowledge him. And what happens? He'll direct your path. So here's a question as, we, as the band comes up. Are you letting God shape your perspective about your circumstances? Or are you letting your circumstances shape your perspective about God? <clears throat> People quit church over this right here. Church hurt. I hurt church hurt. You know, such and such didn't say the right thing to me. I'm hurt. Church hurt, right? Or we have something happen to us in our life. Something doesn't go the way we want. Sometimes we have these deep hurts, and all of a sudden, God isn't good to us anymore because we went through some heavy stuff. And when that happens, we are, we are letting our circumstances shape how we feel about God. Conversely, we can do what Joseph did, who allowed God to shape how he, his perspective about his circumstances. Think about that, church. That's, that was good. Joseph didn't let all these things 
that from a worldly perspective, he could be like, I am, I am estranged from my family. I am never again talking to those dirtbags. They, they are guilty. I didn't do anything. They did it. I didn't sell myself into slavery. I didn't come up with the idea of killing myself. They did. And when our eyes are fixed on our circumstances, we're letting our circumstances shape our perspective about who God is. Church, that's the truth. But man, just like when Peter's in the water and he gets his eyes off Jesus and he gets his eyes on the water, he begins to sink, right? His perspective has changed. So now he's not walking on water. He's sinking in the water. Some of us are sinking not because God did something wrong. Some of us are sinking not because God forgot about us. Some of us are sinking because we've not, we're not glorifying God. Some of us are sinking because we're not saying, God, in all things, I trust you. No matter what that doctor says when he walks through the doors, I trust you. So as we stand, are you letting God shape your perspective about your circumstances? Or are you letting your circumstances shape your perspective about God? Now, to be real, we all have those moments where our circumstances are overwhelming us. I get that. I would not be fair if I didn't say that. You know, get up here and just say, you know, black and white. I understand we have emotions and there's times where we get angry and hurt and frustrated. Obviously, me too. But would you let God in today? Wherever you're at, whatever's happened to you, would you, would you let God in? Here's what we're going to do. We've got altars here where you can come and pray for yourself or someone else. You can pray right where you're at. But with this last song, let's just talk to him and really think about that question.
didn't happen, but I can imagine a scenario where Joseph spent the rest of his life beating himself up, saying, man, I, I, I deserved what they gave me. I deserved it. You ever been there? I have. Beating myself up, beating myself up, beating myself up. Maybe you're there today. Maybe you know, Kyle's talked to us about forgiveness, and we've seen that in Joseph's story. Maybe today you need to forgive yourself. Maybe today you need to let go. Maybe today you need to receive God's grace and forgiveness and let go of your own stuff. Say, God, that's in the past. Today I'm a follower of Christ and I'm a new creation and I'm moving forward in your grace. No better day for that than today. Father, we thank you so much for your grace. Lord, that, that verse that Kyle shared with us, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. Father, so often in that verse, we emphasize the first part, we need to forgive. But Lord, remind us when necessary, the second part of that, that you have forgiven that we can walk in your grace, we can walk in your forgiveness, we can leave the past behind. Thank you for that reminder today. 
And Father, for the one who maybe is struggling to forgive somebody else, Lord, give them the grace and the courage and the humility to do it. And I pray once again, as, as we prayed earlier, Lord, if there's anybody in this room or online who's doubting your love, pray that those doubts would disappear. We thank you for your presence in this place today. We thank you for the gift of our church family, for the gift of worshiping you together. Strengthen us and guide us, Lord, as we go our separate ways today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Maybe seated. Great service today. Welcome. Thank you, as always. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you're new today or maybe you've been here for a few weeks and you have not filled out a Connect card, we would really, really, really love it and be grateful if you would do that. It looks like this. It's, it should be in a seat pocket in front of you. Uh, if you would just take a minute, fill that out. There's a, a gray offering box on each side of the door as you're leaving. If you would just drop it in there, we would appreciate it. And if you brought an offering with you today, then you can drop that in there as well. Uh, don't forget, to, if this is your church home, download the Church Center app. Uh, we've got lots of information on there, lots of helpful things for you there. Don't forget, celebrate recovery tomorrow night, uh, 7 p.m. every Monday. Uh, come check that out. And then uh, we've been having our small groups emphasis. You can still join. It's never too late to join a small group. We have a connect wall next to the kitchen window in the lobby. Check that out. There's resources there to help you get connected. Also, if you're new and wanting to get connected, we have something coming up in a couple weeks on September 24th called Connect 101 Starting Point. Uh, we will meet for a light lunch after second service. We'll meet in the conference room right over here off the lobby like I said, we'll have a little bit of food together. You'll get to meet some of our staff. We'll just, uh, it's kind of an introduction to Pitnaz and who we are as a church. So we want to invite you to that. Also, next Sunday, the 17th at 6.30, we're having our quarterly worship night. Uh, those are always great nights of just worshiping together. And we want to invite you to that. A nursery is going to be provided for, uh, for that event. And then one other thing that we're going to do, we've been having fellowship after those services and so I mentioned a few weeks ago that Kyle just passed his 20th anniversary of being at this church as a pastor. First as a youth pastor, now as lead pastor. And so after worship night next Sunday, we're going to have a, just some fellowship in the gym. We're going to celebrate Kyle and his family uh, and their leadership. There's going to be cupcakes. Uh, if you want to bring a card or something like that, you're welcome to do that. But I hope you can join us. Uh, that'll all start at 630 with worship night in here. A couple other things. Baptism Sunday is coming up October 1st. October 1st. If you are a follower of Christ and you've never been baptized you need to be baptized, and we want to invite you to do that. So let us know uh, if you're interested in that. Contact the church office. You can also find uh, the form for that online or on the Church Center app. Uh, we are also, we came to our attention this week, we have uh, a family connected to our church. They also are, are connected to Connecting Point in Colum or Columbus campus, who is um, a family member, had an accident a short time ago, and because of that, they, ha they are in dire, dire, dire financial straits, and we'd like to receive a love offering for them today. Uh, there's a couple ways you can do that. You can, uh, you can go online or on the Church Center app, go to the Give tab, and then uh, there should be a drop-down menu. In fact, there is. I looked at it this morning. There's a, the, a drop-down menu, and there's a category called Love Offering, and so you can donate that way. You can also, if you have cash that you would like to donate for that today, there should be an offering envelope that looks like this, again, should be in the seat pockets in front of you somewhere, if not right in front of you. Uh, you can put your cash in there and then write on the back, love offering. And then the third option is you can write a check and put love offering in the memo. And so three ways that you can participate in that, and we would love to really bless this family. So finally, one other thing, I have a road construction update. <laughs> we are making progress, folks. Some of you may have come in from Rouse today. Isn't it awesome? It's striped and everything. Okay, now here's, that's the good news. Bad news is they're not done yet. So starting tomorrow, the other half of Quincy down to Joplin Street will be closed. Starting tomorrow, everybody with me? 
starting tomorrow to enter our church property, you're going to have to come from Rouse. And so what we're going to do, we'll work on it this week. We'll have next, next week we'll have the flags out and we'll probably have some volunteers out for a few Sundays just to help. Um, we're, we'll, we'll now ha- we're going to have two entrances for the time being, entrances slash exits. So what we're going to ask you to do, drive, you got to drive a little bit past the church. We have a brand new driveway over here that goes into the gravel lot between here and the homestead. You'll need to go a little bit past the church. We're going to make that an entrance only. And then you'll, in, you'll enter the, the church property that way. And then this, this drive out here that goes under the covered parking, the covered thing out here, that's going to be an exit only. So you'll enter over here. Everybody point back here. Enter over here. Exit over here. We'll help you with that. We'll put something out on social media as well. But we're making progress, folks. We're making progress. I don't think they're going to be done by October, though. Just, just, just a hunch. I don't know. But it's, remember what we're saying. It's going to be nice when it's done. All right, everybody stand with us. Let's say the blessing together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. You are loved by an extraordinary God. Have a great day.